Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast, Episode 35, Ptolemaic Egypt, War and Peace in the Birdcage of the Muses. Quick announcement, everyone. For the last year and a half that the Hellenistic Age podcast has been in operation, the support I've received from listeners across the globe has been overwhelming. As a way to say thank you during this holiday season, I'm pleased to announce a giveaway event. I have 10 high-quality, custom-made bookmarks based upon the show that 10 lucky listeners chosen at random will receive in the mail. If you would like to enter yourself into the contest, all you have to do is send me an email at hellenisticagepodcast at gmail.com or message me via any of my social media accounts, such as Twitter, Facebook, etc. With the subject line being contest or I would like a nice bookmark, eh, something along those lines. I plan to include a preview of the bookmark in the episode notes and the podcast description. And the contest will run from the day of this episode's release, which should be approximately November the 25th, 2019, until the release day of episode 36, upon which I will send a message to the winners to let them know to claim their prize. In addition, I'd like to say thanks to listener Nick Counts for his assistance with the script writing process, and wish a happy birthday to Mr. Counts as well. In the last episode, we spent our time covering affairs outside of Egypt, primarily dealing with Ptolemy Carinus and Arsinoe II, in addition to our charming discussion on royal sibling marriages. Today, we will be focusing on the reign of Ptolemy II Philadelphos, who would rule for almost 40 years and bring Alexandria to the apex of its prosperity. If there were a single expression or phrase that you could use to describe the royal court of Alexandria, several choices come to mind. Extravagance, pomp and circumstance, or perhaps decadent and self-aggrandizing. What cannot be denied is that the Ptolemies understood the need for theatrics as part of their role as kings, and in the context of Hellenistic court life, you could find no better example than that of Ptolemy II. True, Ptolemy I was no stranger to royal displays and affectations when he needed them. After all, the man served with Alexander the Great and was privy to some of the greatest parades and festivals of all time. But it was during the reign of Ptolemy II that court life in Alexandria crystallized into the entity that we inherently associate with their rule. Some of it was necessary to demonstrate his right as a king. Philadelphos would never engage in military campaigns to the same degree as his father, and therefore attain the notion that he was a conqueror worthy of Alexander. I don't mean to imply that Ptolemy was a pacifist by any extent. He was more than willing to demonstrate his military might when it came to retaining the territories under his control. He virtually established a hegemony over the eastern Mediterranean and Aegean Sea by the use of a powerful navy, and was directly responsible for the launch of the First Syrian War with the Seleucids, which we will come to in a bit. Such was the nature of Hellenistic kingship, and even required by his position as pharaoh to the native Egyptians. But Ptolemy II sought to make sure that the embodiment of his power could be felt primarily in the beating heart of the Ptolemaic Empire, Alexandria, almost all of which he and his successors would treat as their court to radiate their illustrious aura. Many of the features of Alexandria would be initiated by Ptolemy I, but Ptolemy Philadelphos took it to a whole new level. In 275, at the festival known as the Ptolemaea, where the royal ancestors like Ptolemy I and Berenike I were celebrated by the cults who deify them, Philadelphos put on an elaborate procession and clearly designed to inspire awe in all as they traveled through the main road of Alexandria. The description of the event is recorded by Athenius in great detail, too much for me to entirely recite or describe, but I will give you a bit of a taste. Quote, in the Dionysiac procession, there marched at the head Seleni, who kept back the crowds. They were dressed in purple riding cloaks, some in red. These were closely followed by satyrs, twenty at each end of the stadium, carrying torches ornamented with gilt ivy leaves. After these came victories with gold wings. These carried censers nine feet high, ornamented with gilt ivy sprays. The women had on embroidered tunics, and their persons were covered with much gold jewelry. After them followed a double altar nine feet long, ornamented in high relief with gilt ivy foliage, having a gold crown of great leaves twined with striped white ribbons. Following this came 120 boys in purple tunics, carrying frankincense and myrrh, and moreover, saffron upon gold trenchers. 
It continues later. After these came a four-wheeled cart, 21 feet long and 12 feet wide, drawn by 180 men. In this stood a statue of Dionysus, 15 feet tall, pouring a libation from a gold goblet, and wearing a purple tunic extending to the feet, over which was a transparent saffron coat. But round his shoulders was thrown a purple mantle spangled with gold. In front of him lay a gold Laconian mixing bowl, 150 gallons, also a gold tripod, on which lay a gold censer and two saucers full of cassia and saffron. Over him stretched a canopy decorated with ivy, grapevine, and the other cultivated fruits, and hanging on to it were also wreaths, ribbons, bacchic wands, tambourines, fillets, and satiric, comic, and tragic masks. End quote. Clearly, Ptolemy II sought to pay homage to his ancestral god Dionysus, and the cult statues of both Ptolemy and Berenike, Alexander, and the various gods of the Olympic pantheon. Anthenius also describes enormous amounts of treasure and riches, along with a menagerie of animals from across the world, ranging from ostriches, lions, chariots pulled by elephants dressed in golden armor, with hundreds of thousands of participants such as musicians, religious figures, and performers dressed to the nine. If Ptolemy was looking to impress people with his wealth and devotion to the gods, he had done it in spades. Reportedly, the whole affair cost 2,300 talents of silver, an immense amount of money for what was effectively an elaborate demonstration. Ptolemy had also sought to emphasize his martial prowess by displaying a military parade as well, having 80,000 soldiers of various origins such as Macedonians, Celts, North African tribesmen, and more. Perhaps, as a way to appeal to the sensibilities of his native Egyptian subjects, he made sure to include dozens of Nubians from the south delivering tribute, reminding one of the famous relief of Ramesses II charging the forces of the Nubians in his war chariot. These public displays, while visually striking and a clear testament to the unrivaled wealth of the Egyptian kingdom, were not the main focus of Ptolemy II in his efforts to broadcast his power. That would be done through his work on building up Alexandria as a city of wonder and intellectual discourse. Poets, scientists, and artists were attracted to the generous patronage of the Ptolemaic court from around the ancient world. Famous men like Callimachus, Erasthenes, Theocritus, and Apollonius of Rhodes would all conduct their notable work under the payroll of Ptolemy II. The foundation of the famous Library of Alexandria, initially started by Ptolemy I, would be carried to its conclusion by Ptolemy Philadelphus as the premier center of learning in the Hellenistic world, staffing dozens of librarians and filling it with tens, if not hundreds of thousands of scrolls. The library itself was a part of a larger structure known as the Museon, meaning Institution of the Muses, and from where we derive the modern word Museum. This is the building which scholars, under the pay of the Ptolemies, would conduct their studies, copy texts, and provide knowledge and instruction to those willing to learn. While this isn't quite the equivalent of a modern university, its long-standing reputation as a center of learning and science spread across many centuries and cultures. The Letters of Aristeas, a pseudo-historical collection of letters of a Jewish author living during Ptolemy II's reign, recounts with pride that Ptolemy may have authorized a translation at the library of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek with the cooperation of the high priest Eleazar. This is possibly a fabricated story, but the inclusion of the Library of Alexandria and Ptolemy II may add a level of intellectual legitimacy to the Hebrew Bible and the Greek translation which would become known as the Septuagint. There are many aphorisms and anecdotes indicating that Ptolemy was a learned man himself, or at least respected the idea of learning. According to the Roman author Vitruvius, a poet named Zoilus of Macedon started reciting lines that bashed Homer's Iliad and Odyssey in Ptolemy's presence, and the king angrily punished him for daring to criticize the poet in such a manner, possibly crucifying him. As extreme as that is, other writers such as the poet-philosopher of the 3rd century BC, Timon of Phleos, satirized the relationship of Ptolemy and the intellectuals of Alexandria, describing the Museon as, as the birdcage or bird's nest of the muses, whereby Ptolemy would be the one feeding the proverbial treats to the squabbling pets or chicks. Interestingly, Ptolemy seems to have not exclusively relied upon beautifying the city or adding to his own luster through the promotion of Greek culture. According to the Roman author Pliny the Elder, Philadelphus endeavored to bring a 24-foot stone obelisk to Alexandria, dating from the reign of an Egyptian pharaoh Nechthebis. 
probably a misunderstanding of the name of the last native Egyptian pharaoh, Nectanebo II. The gesture appears to be an appeal to his native Egyptian subjects, a way to legitimize Ptolemy further as pharaoh of Egypt, or perhaps both, because apparently the costs and labor to move the obelisk were extremely pricey. He is also recorded as being a generous ruler to the temples and cults of native Egyptian gods, such as Apis and Atum, as per his role as pharaoh. Arsinoe herself was just as involved in the patronage and court life of the empire. Her unique marriage to Ptolemy granted her a position nearly unmatched by any of the queens and rival Hellenistic kingdoms. Coins of the period show both Ptolemy and Arsinoe side by side as functionally equal rulers. This was more tolerable in Egypt, given that Egyptian women's rights both in the monarchy and in lower classes were greater than their female equivalents in the Greco-Macedonian world. She would be the patron of festivals such as the Adonia, a public festival built on celebrating the goddess Aphrodite and the fertility of Egypt's land and peoples, with Arsinoe the figurehead for the goddess. She appears to have been a favorite for poets such as Theocritus and Posidippus, who wrote numerous hymns and praises in her honor, perhaps indicating she was quite generous in her donatives to artists, as indicated by Callimachus declaring her the tenth muse in his works. The court life of Ptolemy II Philadelphus and Alexandria clearly has many layers to it. The use of intellectual institutions and patronage provided practical benefits, such as extensive education opportunities for administrators or royal children, or having access to some of the most learned minds in the Greek-speaking world for projects around the kingdom. There were intangible benefits as well, because the flow of wealth from Ptolemaic kings into the coffers of artists, poets, and philosophers allowed for reciprocation in the form of flattering odes, panegyrics, dedications, and more, which all added to the luster of the Ptolemies. The generous patronage of the Greek arts and sciences reinforced the notion that Alexander would be the premier center of Greek culture, not only in Africa, but perhaps in the entire Hellenistic world, attracting visitors, settlers, and more to continuously add to the greatness of Ptolemy's kingdom. Putting on elaborate displays like the Grand Procession, the building of the great temples, buildings and monuments that adorn Alexandria, all of these were the manifestation of the prosperity and power that the Ptolemies were able to project, and both implicitly and explicitly take credit for. Having said all this, let us turn to the man most responsible, Ptolemy II Philadelphos, and follow his reign over the decades to see the ramifications of his actions, both at home and abroad. Hello, fans of the Hellenistic Age. My name is Dominic. Long ago, even the Hellenistic Greeks knew that Egypt was truly old. The calm waters of the Nile had witnessed countless generations, and on the banks of that river, a skilled and creative people had fashioned the greatest kingdom on earth. If you like your history ancient, then the History of Egypt podcast is for you. A tale of pyramids, pharaohs, gods, and magic, told through the eyes of the ancients themselves. And now, back to the Hellenistic Age, with your wonderful host, Derek. Enjoy! Ptolemy Philadelphos' ascension to the Egyptian throne in 282, to his marriage with his sister Arsinoe II by 275, was a time most expedient to his foreign policy. Macedon was in a state of perpetual chaos, thanks to his half-brother Carinus, who did Ptolemy and Arsinoe a favor by getting himself killed at the hands of Celtic invaders who would swarm over Greece and into Asia Minor in 279 and wreak havoc there for a few years before their eventual defeat by their combined efforts of Antigonus Gonatas in Thrace and Antiochus I in Asia Minor by 275. Antiochus would have to spend his time consolidating his rule after his father's assassination, and Ptolemy took full advantage of the Seleucids' neglect of southern Anatolia by capturing territory across the Aegean and Asia Minor, such as the island of Samos and the city of Halicarnassus, along with the rest of Caria. To Antiochus' fury, Ptolemy seemed to have actually benefited from the Celtic incursion, because he managed to recruit thousands of talented Galatian warriors to serve in his armies, even if they would rebel from time to time. But the Seleucid king had managed to get the last laugh because in 275, Antiochus betrothed his daughter Apama to a rebel leader in Kyrene, none other than Magas. As a brief reminder from episode 33, Magas was the stepson of Ptolemy I, adopted through the king's marriage to Magas' mother Berenike, making him the half-brother of Philadelphos and Orsinoe II. 
Given his unfavorable position, there was almost no way that Magas was ever going to inherit the Egyptian throne. Even Ptolemy Carinus had a better chance, being the actual flesh and blood of Ptolemy I. Despite this, Magas seems to have been entrusted with a considerable amount of power by his stepfather, perhaps at the behest of his mother who had held considerable sway over the well-being of her children. And in 300 BC, Magas was ordered to suppress the rebellious city of Kyrene. Kyrene was the foremost city of Libya, founded in the 7th century by Greek colonists who had long since turned their kingdom into a republic, prospering as the most Hellenic town in all of North Africa. The arrival of Ptolemy Soter and his generals would force the Kyreneans to bow to their new Macedonian overlords, and they would rebel several times in the decades following aided by their geographic isolation from the Nile Delta thanks to inhospitable desert, and were aware of Ptolemy's conscious efforts to make Alexandria the bastion of Greek culture in the region. Magas' quelling of the rebellion in 300 landed him the position as governor, which strikes me as both a reward and a snub. He was given a rather high position of command given his status, but was geographically removed from the center of Ptolemaic power as to not pose a threat to Ptolemy's next heir. Acting as governor did little to sate Magus' appetite for a kingdom in his own right, and his hunger would drive him to resist against Philadelphos. By 276, Magas felt comfortable enough to formally declare himself as king of Kyrene, and by extension his independence from Ptolemy's kingdom. And to add legitimacy, he was married to the Seleucid princess Apama as a bit of encouragement on Antiochus's part to wreak havoc in the Ptolemaic kingdom. In 275, Magas launched a military campaign to invade the Nile Delta, with the ultimate goal to take Alexandria. Before he and Ptolemy would clash, the step-siblings would independently be side-saddled by internal rebellions. Some native Libyan nomads had begun to attack Magas's rear and forced him to return home. While Ptolemy would feel compelled to respond, his own Celtic mercenaries had tried to stage some sort of coup. Forced to leave Magas alone and ultimately acknowledge his rule in Kyrene, Ptolemy would vent his rage upon the Celts, whom he stranded on an island within the Nile River, forcing them to either starve to death or resort to cannibalism. It was at this time that Ptolemy might have experienced the kingly equivalent of a midlife crisis. The betrayal by Magas was one of several factors that may have affected the perception of Philadelphus as a ruler. Antiochus I and the newly crowned Macedonian king Antigonus Gonatas had both managed to win immense prestige for their victories over the Celts with Antiochus even being given the epithet savior for his actions in Anatolia. Ending an internal rebellion wasn't going to win any fanfare. And with Magas' independence, Ptolemy may have felt he needed a great PR campaign to reinforce his dynastic identity. It would be around this time that he would marry Arsinoe II, creating a unified house resistant to dynastic interlopers, while at the same time exalting the status of both siblings as being nearly equivalent to the divine. He also put on his grand procession to dazzle his citizens with a display of the kingdom's wealth, power, and prestige. But this was all just a teaser to the main event, Ptolemy's invasion of Syria into the Seleucid Empire, launching the first of several Syrian wars. The Ptolemies and Seleucids had been butting heads over the region of Coele, Syria since the Battle of Ipsus in 301, as it was an important strategic position to prevent invasions from either direction. Besides, Ptolemy didn't really need to justify his actions using this excuse, since Antiochus' effective collaboration with Magas must have irked him considerably. And if Ptolemy wanted to reassert his right as king of Egypt, he was going to have to display his military might and collect booty and plunder. What better target than the next door empire? In 274, Ptolemy would invade into Coli, Syria. Yet, unfortunately, we know very little about the whole affair but the invasion does not appear to be the glamorous event that he was hoping for. Antiochus was a tried and true military commander since he served with his father at Ipsus at the age of 18, and had been engaged in nearly perpetual warfare since his ascension to the power, while Ptolemy II had been something of a homebody and spent most of his time delegating and administrating rather than fighting. Based on evidence from an Egyptian steel and Babylonian text, we can surmise that Antiochus had managed to rout this initial invasion force before he himself launched a counteroffensive into southern Syria near Egypt. It got to the point that in 273, both Ptolemy and Orsinoe personally visited the eastern Nile Delta to oversee fortifications. But Antiochus could never capitalize on his initiatives because he was faced with numerous threats at home. 
The First Syrian War would ultimately end in a stalemate for both parties in 271, but since Ptolemy couldn't admit that outright, one of the surviving inscriptions from his reign on the Pithom Steel recounts the war as a victory and celebrates using distinctively Egyptian tropes and expressions. Quote, his Majesty went from there to Tashit, at the entrance of the south. The king went to the region of Asia, and he reached Persia, finding the gods of Baket there all entirely. He brought them back to Egypt. They came together with the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Ptolemy, to Kemtit, and they protected His Majesty going to Egypt. They were received by the inhabitants of Egypt, full of joy at the arrival of these gods. After these things, His Majesty was exalted because he had brought back the gods of Egypt. It pleased all of them to come with His Majesty in order to confer honors upon him. Atum will increase his reign to an eternal duration. End quote. The conclusion of the First Syrian War would be capped off with misfortune, as Arsinoe II would die in either 270 or 268 at about 46 years old. Despite only ruling in Egypt for five years, Arsinoe would prove to be a remarkable figure in the history of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Her rather dramatic life story through three husbands and three kingdoms is tempered by her transformation of the Egyptian monarchy in conjunction with Ptolemy II as one of the Theoi Adelphoi. She would be the model for ambitious Ptolemaic royal women, granted considerable economic and political freedom to patronize and help construct Alexandria with her own personal flair. She would be deified into a god by her surviving husband with a temple and city known as the Arsinoeum, sharing space with both the Greek pantheon and the Egyptian one as well. Native Egyptian families found Arsinoe in her cult popular, with many in Memphis naming their daughters Arsinoe in her honor. In the 260s, much of Ptolemy II's attention would not be directed towards the Seleucus nor Magas in Kyrene, but back to the north. More specifically, it would be in Greece, where tensions between the southern Greek cities and King Antigonus Gonatas would flare up, partially thanks to the efforts of Ptolemy himself. In 267, the so-called Cremonidian War would break out between a Greek alliance led by Athens and Sparta and backed by Ptolemaic wealth to proclaim their independence from Macedon, which would last until 261. I plan to discuss this conflict in far greater detail in our upcoming episode on Antigonus Gonatas, but needless to say, Ptolemy had plenty of motivation to pursue such an aggressive interventionist policy. The accession of Antigonus to the Macedonian throne had complicated the balance of power sought by Ptolemy, who had spent a considerable amount of time and money ensuring his naval domination of the Aegean Sea. Gonatas managed to organize the kingdom after a decade of civil war and strife, and engaged in overtures with Antiochus to create a mutual agreement against Ptolemy. It was only logical that Antigonus would approach and destroy Ptolemaic naval bases along the Greek coasts and the Aegean, especially after Ptolemy had involved himself in the affairs of the city of Byzantium in 269-268, thus potentially eliminating Ptolemy's greatest, and most expensive, military asset. This was probably among Ptolemy's chief concerns, especially if the Egyptian king had wanted to maintain his thalassocracy, lest the next inevitable war with the Seleucids broke out. Philadelphus would supply the Athenians and Spartans with grain and money, championing himself as a defender of Greek freedom, and even sent a naval commander named Patroclus to oversee operations, along with his son and heir, Ptolemy III, who managed some of the efforts in the Ionian Sea. Ultimately, the venture was unsuccessful, at least for the Greeks who would remain under the dominion of Antigone Macedon until the arrival of the Romans. But Patroclus had done a remarkably good job at furthering Ptolemaic strongholds across the Aegean, especially on islands like Chaos, Thera, and Lesbos. This was aimed to assist the so-called Island League, a collection of island nations that make up the modern Cyclades and would in turn strengthen Ptolemaic hegemony over the region. This northern venture did not divert all of Ptolemy Philadelphus' attention from his eastern borders. Ever since the end of the First Syrian War, Ptolemy had sought to rectify his mistakes with the foundation and reinforcement of cities in the regions of Phoenicia and southern Syria, expanding his navy and army through shipbuilding, land settlement of mercenaries, and even sending hunting parties into modern Ethiopia and Sudan to gather war elephants as a way to circumvent the Seleucid monopoly. 
The construction of a great canal connecting the Nile Delta and the Red Sea was instrumental, both as a way to allow for a faster movement of the Royal Navy and to provide easier access to the wealth of trading with both India and Africa to fund the immense cost of all of these projects, fueled directly by Ptolemy's Cold War with the Seleucid Empire. This Cold War would make itself apparent as both kingdoms directly and indirectly attempted to sabotage each other's position in the Mediterranean. One of the biggest areas would be in Asia Minor, which had begun to fragment and become independent of Seleucid control, particularly in the new kingdom of Pergamon under Eumenes I, while the rest of southern Asia Minor had fallen into Ptolemy's hands. This isn't to say that the fragmentation of Asia Minor didn't cause ramifications in the house of Ptolemy either. Philadelphus had endeavored to hand control of the city of Ephesus to his stepson, the last surviving child of Arsinoe II, Ptolemy Epigonus. We don't know the exact time Epigonus was given command, but after a few years of governing, he would declare himself king in Asia Minor in about 260 BC. No doubt he was inspired by the recent movements of Eumenes I, and it is probably fair to say that he, like Magas and Ptolemy Karanos, had probably felt resentful of his position in the royal family, and the unlikely chances he was ever going to rule, especially considering he was the last surviving heir of King Lysimachus, and may have felt that he had some lingering traces of dynastic loyalty to Lysimachus and Arsinoe. It is also entirely possible that Ampignus was just incredibly impatient, as there are suggestions that he was considered a co-ruler up to this point. He had coordinated his rebellion with a mercenary named Timarchus, who had become tyrant of Samos by killing one of Ptolemy's generals. But Epigonus' brief grab to power was not to last, as he would be killed by his own soldiers in about 259. Philadelphus would not have time to strike back at Timarchus. Instead, the tyrant's fate would be decided by the new Seleucid king, Antiochus II, who took over after his father Antiochus I had died in 261, after a failed attempt to recapture Pergamon. Antiochus II had managed to capture the city of Miletus and Samos, and had Timarchus executed in either 259 or 258. The only problem was that Ptolemy II still considered Samos as part of his domain, making the Seleucid king's expedition a direct affront to his sovereignty, and the perfect excuse to turn the Cold War into a hot one, thus beginning the Second Syrian War. This is part and parcel of Ptolemaic-Seleucid relations, a Syrian war is started as part of a prestige campaign or some legitimate gripe, fighting follows, and a peace treaty is signed between the two kings. The monarchs still aggravate each other through proxies and subversion, and once one of the monarch dies, the peace treaty is seen as null and void, and war begins anew. At this point, they were looking for conflict. And so, they had it. Unfortunately, the Second Syrian War is probably the least understood out of all the Syrian wars, including the first. From what we can gather, based upon John D. Granger's book on the Syrian Wars, the bulk of fighting would be in Asia Minor, Syria, and the Aegean Sea. The great navy that Ptolemy had built up would be strained, as multiple fronts on land and sea had to be maintained when you had external pressure from the Seleucids and internal rebellions and attacks by the likes of Rhodes, which normally was very friendly to the Ptolemies, but managed to ally with Antiochus to prevent the Egyptian navy from using the island city as a port. Although Ptolemy had managed to send land forces into Syria, Antiochus had responded with a reconquest of Cilicia in western Anatolia, and the Ptolemaic naval bases supporting the Cyclades were lost. Despite internal propaganda found in Egypt suggesting that Ptolemy had triumphed over the quote-unquote pro-Persian king, the end of the Second Syrian War in 253 BC would not end in Philadelphus' favor. It seems that the war itself was a draw. Though, surface level, Antiochus had the most gains and Ptolemy had the most losses. But peace was something that was desperately needed for both sides. Ptolemy had to squeeze his subjects even tighter to collect taxes to pay for the war, and possibly indemnities, while Antiochus was facing a major crisis in his eastern territories of Parthia and Bactria. The inevitably temporary peace was cemented with a marriage alliance between the Ptolemaic and Seleucid houses as the Ptolemaic princess Berenike would marry Antiochus and become his principal wife. The whole arrangement was just the groundwork for another Syrian conflict, and the cycle will repeat ad nauseum. At this point in 253, Ptolemy II was in his late 50s, and the Second Syrian War would be the last great foreign expedition of his reign. We should close up our episode with Ptolemy's domestic affairs, particularly his dealings with his stepbrother King Magas of Kyrene. Magas had been living large as the ruler of prosperous Kyrene, so to speak, and had been left alone for the better part of 50 years. 
His reign was noted by even peoples as far afoot as the Mauryan Empire Ashoka, who referred to Magas as Maka, one of the great kings of the West. The bulk of Magas' time had been spent in Kyrene enjoying the perks of rule, mainly through sating his gluttonous appetite with food and drink. Towards the end of his life, he was so heavy that he was almost unable to move, and eventually would die in 250 as a result of his overeating, a precursor to Ptolemy VII Physcon, perhaps, but nowhere near as deadly or cunning. The relationship between Ptolemy and Magas was understandably strained since the latter's rebellion in 276, but it's interesting to note that there were no further conflicts between the two, even when Magas was perfectly capable of attacking Egypt during the strenuous periods of the Second Syrian War. Perhaps there was a lingering trace of brotherly love, or at least tolerance, because in the late 250s, the step-siblings had sought reconciliation with one another. Get out those family trees, everyone, because Philadelphus' son, Ptolemy III, would eventually be married to Berenike, the daughter of Magas and his wife Apama. This makes sense on Philadelphus' part, because therefore Ptolemy III would have the right to inherit Kyrene, but this wasn't as smooth of a process as I've described. There were many parties upset by the eventual reunification of the Ptolemaic kingdom in Kyrene, Berenike's Seleucid mother, Apama, and the Kyrenians who wanted independence, for instance. Despite this, the marriage would go through upon Ptolemy III's accession to the throne. The betrothed couple would not have to wait long. The king would spend his last years at home doting over his many mistresses or engaged in further construction projects, and in 246 BC, Ptolemy II Philadelphos would die at the age of 63 after ruling for roughly 40 years, finally joining Arsinoe in the afterlife as one of the Theoi Adelphoi. In the opinion of scholars such as John D. Granger, Egypt under Ptolemy II was the premier power of the Hellenistic world for almost half a century. While not himself a military man, he was an able administrator and king, capable of handling multiple threats across the Mediterranean with the aid of diplomacy, subterfuge, and an enormous cache of wealth he cultivated through his administrative policies. It would be under his reign that Alexandria would blossom as the center of Greek culture and learning, thanks to his patronage of the arts and sciences. His death, along with that of Arsinoe II, Magas, and Ptolemy Carinus, would also effectively mark the end of the second generation of the House of Ptolemy, which, for better or for ill, had dominated the politics of the Mediterranean for over four decades. Since Ptolemy I's Soter's takeover in 320, down to Ptolemy II's death in 246, their kingdom in Egypt had proved to be remarkably successful, and it has reached its zenith, and will continue to do so through the reign of our next Ptolemy, Ptolemy III Eurigetes, and his wife, Berenike II. It is here that I will pause our journey with the Ptolemies, and take a brief break from the overall narrative. The next episode will be a look at one of the defining institutions of our period, the Hellenistic city, and following that we'll cover the reign of Antigonus, Gonatas, and Macedon, bringing to a close our coverage on the Hellenistic Big Three for the moment. I have roughly planned out the schedule for the next several episodes that will bring us into the start of the new year, and, as a teaser to what's to come, we'll be returning to the central Mediterranean to deal with the likes of Agathocles of Syracuse, the Carthaginians, and the First Punic War. If you liked what you've been listening to, please consider subscribing or leaving a review on what you thought of the show. I also encourage you to visit my website at hellenisticagepodcast.wordpress.com for my family trees, episode notes, and bibliographies relating to the period. Or you can follow me on a number of social media accounts, such as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, by following the links on my website or in the episode description. As a reminder to those still listening, make sure to enter the contest before the next episode's release by emailing me or messaging me with the subject of contest or giveaway. So... Until next time, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>